Psalm chapter 50. I'm going to start reading in verse 14. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I shall rescue you and you will honor me. One of the greatest things that we can do to participate in the kingdom is simply to give back out of our finances, out of our money. We are the wealthiest nation on the earth. The income level of everyone put together here in the United States, if you put all of our income levels together, we make up 94% of all the income levels in the world. In other words, we're higher than all the other income levels around the world. And yet, many people and some nations that have some of the lowest economies are better givers than Americans because Americans, Kathleen, they uh, have not had good teaching on giving. They haven't had good teaching on tithing. And the world where it's going, uh, it used to be when I was a kid, if you came in the church and didn't give something, uh, your parents would just kind of, kind of, kind of lean out and, you know, hit the back of your head going like, loosen up that wallet there. And that would go for the men and the women, the boys and the girls in growing up. And now today, many times people come to church, repeatedly come to church, they're watching us live, they send in questions, they want to talk, they want to interact, and yet they have nothing to give to the household of God. And that's why many times those same people, when they get into trouble, there's nothing there to rescue them. The Bible says over in Malachi chapter 3, that if we give, he will rebuke the devourer for your sake. He'll rebuke Satan for your sake because you have been part of the support, part of the flow of making sure the gospel gets out. And boy, it's important that the gospel gets out. I, we're just doing so many things here in this ministry. If people only knew everything that we're doing here in the ministry, sometimes I don't even know everything that we're doing. I really don't. I don't see the impact all the time. And a lot of times I don't see the impact. One of the things that just happened to us recently, back three weeks ago, we, or four weeks ago, we went on television in Kenya. And we were going to be on once a month. And then we went to twice a month within the week because they liked our program. Then we went on twice a week. And then we went on, now we're on every single night at 8 p.m. Nairobi time seven days a week. And the reason why I know it is because Pastor George Thiongo, who may be watching this afternoon, he, he just dials me up on the phone or hits record and go watch. You can watch live. We don't interact much, but he's showing me his home and the kids sitting in front of the TV and the television is on and they're still having issues in, in, in Kenya as well. We're praying for them, but it's nice to know that we're on television now in another country live in addition to other countries downloading our messages. Everything that we do, everything that we do, all the financial support that we have put in and that you have put in goes to winning souls for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Goes to winning souls for the kingdom. And that's permanent return. So many times preachers aren't gonna be at the top of the honor ladder in heaven. It's going to be people that gave, that quietly gave, that secretly gave to the mission of the kingdom. And that is to get more souls into the kingdom of God. And look at this here. Call upon me in the day of trouble and I shall rescue you and you will honor me. When that rescue comes, you'll give honor back to God. The honor will come with praise. The honor will come with giving. And we pay our vows. Many times throughout the week, we go, God, if I get that sale, if I save $2,000 on this car, I'll give 10% of it to you. That's a vow. And God wants us to pay our vows. And anytime we make a, a commitment in our heart or even with our words to God, say, well, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Come Sunday morning, come whatever time is appropriate, we should keep our vows to God. Can I hear an amen? 
And one of the things I want to remind you here and also all of you that are watching live and watching on television, it's vitally important for you to give to this ministry. Don't slow down giving just because COVID's letting up. We still need your aggressive support. We still need to hear from you. And if you're watching right now, you can give in several different ways right off of our website. And if you're watching on YouTube or Roku and you want to go to the website later on, mountainfaith.org, and you can give right off those platforms. So make sure that you give. It is very important, even if you're given small amounts, that you keep continually giving steadily unto the Lord. Praise God. Let's pray. Dear Father Yahweh Elohim, we invoke your name once again over the service, over these gifts and these givings. And Father God, every gift and every giver, Father, I ask that you'd rebuke the devourer for their sakes. And Father God, that if they have a day of trouble, as they call upon you, that you rescue them. Father, and I thank you for that now. And reward them back. And Father, I thank you for that in Jesus' mighty name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Ushers, come on forward here this morning. Again, if you're watching live, become a regular financial partner with this ministry. God sees what you're doing. Praise God, praise God. Let's uh, do what we normally do every single Sunday morning. Let's stand to our feet here today. Let's take our Bibles and let's stand up to our feet and wave them around in the air a little bit. If you're watching at home, do the same thing right with us and say, this is my Bible. I can be what it says I can be. I can do what it says I can do. And I can have what it says I can have. My mind is alert and my spirit is receptive to the living Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Turn to a couple people around you and say, um, you're looking good here today. Praise God. Amen. Kathy, you're looking good here today. Thank you for joining me up here once again this morning. Can we give her a welcome here today? Hallelujah. She doesn't really want it, but give it to her anyway. Uh, <clears throat> You know, we started doing this thing of having you up here, and now I think we got our television audience and our live viewing audience addicted to seeing you. And so if they get bored with my message, they can look over and see what you're up to. Amen. And you're not bored. Amen. So then they get convicted and come back to the message. Hallelujah. Uh, <laughs> Dear Father Yahweh Elohim, we invoke your name once again over this message here this morning. Holy Spirit, have your way in this place. Have your way in our minds and our hearts. Have your way across the airwaves on television and into the homes of everyone watching right now. Make your presence be felt and be known. And Father God, raise up your people. Get them off their deathbeds. Get them off their sickbeds. Get them off the problems that they have. Amen. And I give you glory for that. And Father God, I ask that this come forward with power, with enthusiasm, according to your spirit and your will, and with the solemnity, Father God, that you'd want me to give it. In Jesus' mighty name, and all God's people said amen and amen and amen. Um, as we're uh, hearing in the series, I started this series on a Wednesday night, and I wasn't intending to start a series on a Wednesday night, and we had a good discussion on Pentecost a couple days before Pentecost and the day before Shavuot, or weeks for the Jewish community. And we had a good discussion, it went lo much longer. And in fact, Kathy, that was one of the first messages, well, it's one of the messages that went uh, for two nights in Kenya, uh, when they played two nights in a row. They split that up and they, they played it twice. We're hearing that the Holy Spirit is more than just the nine gifts as listed in 1 Corinthians 12. And I've been talking about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, I imagine now, for over 30 years. I've been preaching on the gifts of the Holy Spirit for well over 30 years. And one of the biggest revelations that I've entered into recently, although it's been a transition of revelation, and that is the Holy Spirit isn't just, doesn't just come to give us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit didn't just come so that we would have power. And the Holy Spirit didn't just come so that the Holy Spirit would be and give a testimony concerning the ministry of Jesus Christ. So there are subtle things that we cannot perceive and we don't notice going on around us. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 61 this morning, Isaiah 61. If you need a Bible here today, raise your hands. The ushers will be happy to get you a Bible. 
Isaiah 61. And all the last several chapters of Isaiah is all about prophecy. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 10, it says this, I will greatly rejoice in Yahweh. My soul will exult in my God. He has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with jewels. Now, if you look at this passage very carefully, and I want everyone here and everyone watching live to look at this passage very carefully. If you have your Bibles out, it's important that you look at this. First, he said, I rejoice greatly in Yahweh. My soul will exult in my God. And this is a prophecy of things to come. And it's a prophecy of what Jesus did and what he's doing for us currently. And it's also a prophecy of what the Holy Spirit is doing. Now watch this. He said, for he has clothed me. When we talk about clothing, we talk about something that we put on and something that other people see. He has clothed me with garments. And now we see a second Hebrew term. And I'm not going to give you all these Hebrew terms. I will give you one specifically. But first we see the word clothe. And then we see the poeticness of Scripture. And we see the word garments. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation. And so you're clothed. And then he gets more specific. It's a garment. And he says of salvation. And I would like to say that that salvation there is referring directly to Jesus. To Yeshua. Salvation the word salvation in English is Yeshua in Hebrew. And then it goes on to say, he has wrapped me. So if you wrap somebody with something, you're wrapping them with linens and, and you're, you're wrapping them around. You're not wrapping them with something that's ugly or dirty. You're wrapping them with something that's clean, that's bright, that's airy. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. And a robe now is an outer, it's specifically an outer garment for other garments. When you wear a robe, uh, if you're getting up in the morning, you generally would put on a robe, and that's over your other garments. If you put on a robe outside, if it's cold outside, you put on a, a robe of, of maybe a, an animal pelt of some kind. You're wearing that robe over other garments. So a robe is an outer garment over other garments. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland. So decking means to, it means to decorate. To deck means to decorate. Deck the halls, for example. To decorate. So he is decking himself as with a garland or as with something that gives him adornment. And then it goes on to say this. And as a bride adorns herself with jewels. This word adorn here, and we've seen many different words in this little verse, and in the Hebrew they are all different words, but the word adorn is a da in Hebrew, just a da. And it sounds very much similar to adorn in English. So a da is very similar, and it means this in the Hebrew. Hebrew is a very specific language. It means to advance. It means to bedeck. It means to create a testimony and it means to create a testimony as a witness. So what does clothing have anything to do with adornment or to adorn? And you now you advance. If someone is well dressed and they come into a party, everyone says, look how that woman is dressed. Look how that man is dressed. You know, ZZ Top had a song come out years ago. Uh, everyone loves a well dressed man. Right? And it's true. When you come into a party and if you're the best dressed and you're dressed eloquently and it looks like you spent a lot of money on your clothing, that person literally gets advanced in the eyes of everyone else watching. It's not a spiritual thing. It's a very physical, carnal thing. And God is talking here about how he wants to advance you. And how everything that he's giving you is, on the, is, a, is an external thing and not just an internal thing. All right? So adorn in the Hebrew is a duh. It means to advance, bedeck, to create a testimony and to create a testimony as a witness to other people. 
So we have clothed, we have wraparound, we have garments, we have an outer garment, a robe. We have garland, and garland is nothing more than an embellishment. I, I, when we cook, we like to cook. Sometimes we put embellishments on our plate. We don't eat them necessarily. We could, but we put embellishments on our plate. Cooking with different things. We'll be cooking and I'll put sliced oranges there before we make our king salmon and we'll put them on there, but we don't generally eat them later on, but we put them on the plate carefully after cooking and it's an adornment. It's something that even makes the plate look better. A garland is something that makes the individual look better. Jewels on a woman. Notice how as women get older, they tend to wear more bling. It's true. I've noticed that. You know, and, and women as they're getting older, and I'm not saying very old, but as women, generally speaking, are getting older in years, they add the number of rings that they have. They have a greater number of rings and they might inherit some from their, their parents or their mother or their grandmother. And so they begin to wear more things, even if they don't wear a lot at one time. It is an adornment on that particular woman. She's adorning herself as with jewels. So in God, everything that he does by the Holy Spirit in blessing you advances you. Everything that he does by the Holy Spirit in you advances you. The blessing advances you. It advances you, it bedecks you, it creates a testimony in you, and it uses you as a witness because of what God is doing in you and through you. And that's just one of the many things that happens. So when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, several things happen. You receive the visible you can see the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and the visible may be the gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation. But there's also invisible attributes that a person receives. And then what we can see here, that we receive the natural. When we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we get natural attributes given to us, and then we get supernatural attributes and coverings given to us. And all these things are to create an internal an external testimony. When I see what God has done through me all, after all these years, and Kathy is a witness to this as she tells me on a regular basis, how much that I've changed since I have gotten saved and received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's an internal witness to me to see that God is changing me. It's an internal witness to you to see that God is doing a work in you. Some of you wouldn't have graced a church 10 years ago, and now you can't wait to be here. You didn't like what COVID did by shutting down the churches, and you want to be back in. It makes you mad. That's a change in your personality, and that is an internal testimony that you can see personally about yourself. And then there's the external testimony that's going on in your life. You're, you're changing. You may not be changing fast enough for you, but you are changing. You're changing into another man. The Bible says that when King Saul came into the presence of the prophets, he changed into another man. And when we come into the presence of the Holy Spirit, he changes us into another person, into another man. And so we get an external testimony about how we have changed that other people can see. And we create an internal testimony of things that we can see in ourselves. There's many times people have come to me and go, Pastor, what do you think I need to change first in me? I said, whatever you're being convicted by. So, well, God is just telling me to do one little thing. I said, well, that one little thing could be blocking all the other blessings of God. If you feel God is telling you to change that and you don't feel like doing it because it's too insignificant, then you're disobeying the Holy Spirit by making that change in yourself. Who can see the most problems in you? Many times it's just you. Other people can see the exterior, but you know what's going on on the interior. You know what's really wrong with you many times, and you know how to fix what's really wrong with you many times. Just listen to the Holy Spirit and be obedient to the Holy Spirit. So, how can we be clothed? I'm going to just give you some examples of how God is clothed, how Jesus is clothed, how the Holy Spirit is clothed, and how the saints of God have been clothed. In the Bible, it says this, people have been clothed with majesty. God is clothed with majesty. He is clothed with honor. He is clothed with strength. He is clothed with splendor. 
Some people are clothed with shame and dishonor. There are people walking around right now, the Bible says over in Proverbs in particular, that you can be clothed with shame and dishonor because of your activities. And you're clothed with that shame because of some out, outward or external activity that you're doing. You could be participating in the wrong kind of sexual activity. You can be getting involved with the wrong types of people. You can be going down the wrong road and you could stop yourself, but you don't want to stop. And as a result of your external activity, you can be clothed with shame and dishonor. So we can be clothed with many things. I like to think about it this way. I want to be clothed with salvation and glory. To be clothed with salvation is to be known as a friend of Jesus, to be someone that has accepted Jesus as his personal Lord and Savior. When you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, God clothes you with salvation. There's something happening to you, invisible, that you cannot see. Sure, you come to church, sure, you say the name of Jesus, that's the external. But there's also something that's happening on the internal man that no one else can see, not even you many times. Let's go over to Luke chapter 24, Luke 24. Luke chapter 24. I have a word of knowledge for some people that are watching here today. This word is for you. This word will either convict you and show you shame and dishonor. And for some of you, this word will exonerate you and give you honor and glory so that you can praise God once again. This word is for many of you watching here today. In Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 44, now he said to them, these are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. All right, so he's talking about all the prophecy concerning him. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ or that the Messiah would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. And you are my witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city. Listen, you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. When I track this Greek word all the way back to the Hebrew, it is the same word, ada, which means to be clothed, which means to be adorned. I, um, I, have, I have a word here, and I'm, I'm thinking of some people that have come to me and talked to me about this subject over the last two or three years. And if you can hear my voice, and if you're watching here this morning, many times, the entire focus of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I know many of you will agree with me, is one thing. And if you come from a legalistic Pentecostal or legalistic Holy Spirit church, and by the way, there are legalistic Holy Spirit churches, in fact, more legalistic than non-legalistic. The one focus that they will be on once you get baptized in the Holy Spirit is tongues. They can't think of anything else. They don't want you to go out and heal people. They want to hear you talk in other tongues. They want to see you talking in other tongues and talking in other tongues and speaking in other tongues and praying in other tongues is important. But we find out from 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it's not nearly as important as prophecy. It's not nearly as important as many other attributes of the Holy Spirit that become very internalized that you don't know about. And so one of the robes of righteousness, one of the things that the Holy Spirit gives us, that clothing that he gives us, is internal change. He makes you into a new person. We get a new creation when we receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. We become new creatures in Christ. But we get a new personality by the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that changes your personality. It's the Holy Spirit that changes you inside. So it's not, getting the Holy Spirit is not about speaking in tongues five seconds after you receive the Holy Spirit. And praise God if that's what happened to you. 
But it doesn't happen to everyone that way. There are many other things that happens to you when you receive the Holy Spirit. And that's what this message is about today. The adornment of the Holy Spirit. What does the adornment do? It covers you. It clothes you. It gives you things that other people can see and yet other people cannot see. It changes your personality and it changes your outward appearance as well. How many of you have had this happen? You look in the mirror day by day, you're walking with God, you're reading your Bibles, you're praying, and you're looking in the mirror, and, and then you go a week without Jesus. You go a week without the Holy Spirit. You're mad, you're angry, you're working hard, you're tired, you're exhausted, you're on vacation, and you took a vacation from God, and you go and look in the mirror, and you find, you look in the mirror, and you notice that there's something wrong with your visage in the mirror. You know that your face looks different. And it does look different, not just in the mirror and not because of any type of guilt, but because the Holy Spirit, it says that the Holy Spirit actually animates you and gives life to your mortal bones in your body. That the Holy Spirit, it, it, Jesus said it this way, it's the Spirit that gives life. And so your carnal nature, your mind, your will and your emotions, and then the three-part man all put together, your spirit, soul, and body, even though your spirit may be saved, it's still walking in that carnality until you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, number one, and number two, you start walking in the Holy Spirit. I've received many gifts over the years, gave them back traded them in, got a coupon and got something else from the store. You can receive a gift and not use it. You can be baptized with the Holy Spirit and not be walking in the Holy Spirit. It's quiet in here today. You can be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I know many preachers that are baptized in the Holy Spirit and don't walk in the Holy Spirit. And it's clear by their ministries that they're not walking by the Holy Spirit. I know many Christians, many more Christians than preachers that are baptized in the Holy Spirit and yet are not walking in the Holy Spirit. And that does not mean speaking in other tongues. That brings conviction and sometimes condemnation, but it doesn't really make you a better man. In other words, a better species of man. There are other things, other attributes that you need to be paying attention to that the Holy Spirit is bringing to you right now. There are other attributes that the Holy Spirit wants you to pay attention to. I think about it this way. You can't see this. And if you're watching television, you can't see this either. But there have been times over the years where I got up and preached and by the end of the service, I would actually have four or five people sleeping. That's a big, that's a big ego booster right there, Kathleen. When people are sleeping by the end of your message going, I either went too long or I bored them. There are many people that are asleep in the Spirit. They have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but they're asleep in the Spirit. They're not listening to the Spirit. And many times, I've not, I don't remember, you know, aside maybe from being a child, I don't remember ever falling asleep in church. Because when I come, if I made the effort to be there, I want to make, also make the effort to pay attention to what's going on. I'm investing myself in time and money, and travel, clean clothes, shaving. I might as well just pay attention for a little bit. And if I need to sleep, I can go home and do that. And there are people that are asleep in the spirit. Sometimes the same people that might fall asleep in church. We've had people come in here and they've been awake for 30 hours. That's, I'm not talking about those people. I'm not talking about people that just put in a double shift. But how about someone that just habitually shows up and they just fall asleep? You say amen, and they wake up, they say amen, and then they go right back to sleep. But there are some people that are asleep in the Spirit, and they have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and they, they begin to learn a brand new language. And they learn how to quote Scripture, and they learn how to shake their Bible, and they learn how to condemn other people with the Bible. But they haven't changed themselves. There's no inner change. They're not walking in the Spirit. They just have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so there's no inward change going on, even though there's a lot of inward dialogue coming out of them. 
And you can see the dialogue, and they got more Bibles now, and they have more knowledge of the Holy One, but they don't follow the Holy One. Because if you're going to change by the Holy Spirit, you have to walk in the Holy Spirit. So God is love. And He gives us His Spirit, and we begin to see the need for walking in agapeo love, the public demonstration of love. But if we don't walk in the public demonstration of love, we cannot know God's love because the only way we can know it is to first walk in it and then we see its effectiveness on others and then we can turn around and feel his effectiveness of his love towards us. That's how we find out about his love. So someone says that I have love and does not love his brother, does not love God, does not know God, scripture says. Because God is love. So if you hate your brother, you cannot say in turn that you say that you love God. So you, if you do not participate in the baptism of the Holy Spirit by walking it out, you will not have the interchange, no matter how much dialogue coming out of your mouth may convince others that there is an interchange going on. We've had many people over the years, I first started seeing this when long before I became a pastor, I used to go to meetings. And then we'd have someone show up, men and women both, and they would stand up and we wouldn't know where they came from, who their pastor was. We would have no knowledge of their background and they would stand up and go, I'm a prophet of God. Well, okay. Why would you say that if you weren't a prophet of God? Why would you get up and make that announcement? And then they would begin to take over the meeting. They would hijack the religious spiritual meeting that we were having. Hello. And they would hijack and they would take it over and they would not have any respect for the leadership or the anointing that was already there. And they would do it for a reason, either for attention, but if you go back later on and try to find out anything about them, their pastor gave up on them years ago. They've been church hopping for years. There's no one that trusts them, not even their spouse and not even their kids. They have no real home witness. They have a lot of dialogue, but they have no action backing up their dialogue. And so they convince a lot of people, but it's all temporary. It's very limited, but it impresses people that don't know their history and their background. You know what? Even a broken clock is right twice a day. And just because a, someone that stands up and says something that would be, could be used for a hundred people in that same room doesn't make them a prophet. And so we must look at not only the external things of what they're saying, but we also must look at the internal things of what they're saying, but there's even more that we can see on the external that many Christians pass up. And there are things that we could be looking at. Can I hear an amen this morning? Amen. All right. So let's go over to uh, John chapter 3. John chapter 3. In verse 3, Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water... Number one, and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. All right? So you need to have water baptism, salvation, and you also need to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which doesn't have to do with any water at all. And he said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. When you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're going to begin to start taking action and doing things in a unique fashion that you've never done before. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is not enough. You must walk in the Spirit. Now, if you're walking in the Spirit, that means when you come to a particular, you're on your computer. You're doing something on your computer and you hear a little voice say to you, don't try that. It's not going to work. You'll spend a half hour. Go over here and try this instead. 
but you've never done that before. And that's exactly what the Holy Spirit is saying here. You do not know where the wind comes from or when the wind go is going. And so is everyone who is born of the Spirit. So if you're born of the Spirit, in other words, you're not just baptized in the Holy Spirit, but you're actually listening to his voice, his still small voice. He will direct you in many ways. This happens to me in the period of a day 20 times, 30 times, 50 times. It could be taking a different road to work. It could be going on to a different program. That's absolutely important. It could be stopping my work on the computer and walking into another room and turning on the television and then I see breaking news that God wanted me to see. I was watching something yesterday, don't know even why I was watching it, while I was eating breakfast, and then Kathy and I were watching, and it came up to different types of crucifixion that even the Jews know about that actually gives a testimony to Jesus and the cross. And that was on Jewish TV yesterday morning. Didn't know why I was watching it. But God was directing me, and as the, we don't know where the wind is coming or where the wind is going, so too is everyone who is truly born and listens to the Holy Spirit. We don't know where we, how we got where we are right now, and we don't really know where we're going because the Holy Spirit will continue to steer us and to send us to places that we had no intention of going to. And that's how one who is baptized in the Holy Spirit and walks in the Holy Spirit. And so someone who is walking in the Holy Spirit not only has supernatural activity, but they have a lot of internal activity. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to your mind and not just trying to empower you to impress other people with your spirituality. It's very much in your intelligence and how you think, and how you're perceiving things. So the Spirit adorns with robes and decks with life. And no man was ever intended to be apart from God. And so the, by the fall of man, Adam and Eve sinning against God, Adam and Eve became very natural. They began to think on more carnal things. And if you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you will think on carnal things and you will think carnally even as a Christian and not understand those that are thinking spiritually as Christians around you. You won't understand. That's one of the problems of being baptized in the Holy Spirit but not listening to the Holy Spirit when he's speaking to you. And the Holy Spirit will tell you a lot more about what you need to do to your, with yourself and to yourself than other people will identify in you and have them be right. People ask me, Pastor, what should I change in me? What's the Holy Spirit telling you to change in you? Well, the Holy Spirit's been telling me this. Well, then you need to do that one thing. You need to do that one thing. Let's go over to chapter 16 of John, chapter 16. John 16, verse 13. But when he comes, the Spirit of truth comes. He will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own initiative, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will disclose to you what is to come. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. What is the difference? One of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is the gift of knowledge. Truth and knowledge are different things completely. Knowledge is what's happening. It's what's happening. Truth is the ethics of what's happening and is the ethics of perception. So if I give you knowledge that five and five equal 10, but I give you the Holy Spirit and he leads you in the truth, the Holy Spirit will give you the ethics of that addition to come to 10, whatever that might be. So you might hear a truth and you'll hear that something is happening in the earth and that'll be a word of knowledge. This is going to happen. There's a war over there. There's, a, there's a, 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 an increase in military uh, stuff over here in another country. There's something happening in the spirit or in the realm and you'll hear it happening. But that's just a word of knowledge. That's not truth. Truth is the ethics of whatever you're thinking about. Whatever you're looking at, however you view those things. So when the spirit of truth comes, we know that the Holy Spirit is the spirit of grace. He's the spirit of power and he is the spirit of truth. 
So when the spirit of truth comes, he will give you an ethical question when you're dealing with something. So the Holy Spirit will begin to speak to you truth and will ask you ethical questions. Is this ethical? What I'm about to do, is this ethical? Should I do something that's ethical? Should I start doing something that's ethical? You'll be standing at the grocery line, you come up to the counter, you give them a certain amount of money and they give you back, instead of $5.10, they give you $15.10. All of a sudden now, you have a knowledge that you have the wrong amount of money, but now the gifting of the Holy Spirit giving you truth will give you an ethics problem. And you will have to decide whether or not you tell that woman that she just gave you $10 too much. I can't walk away. If I think that they gave me a quarter too much, I'll go, I think you gave me a quarter too much. Many times I'm right, about half the time. Other times I just misadded what was in my hand or miscalculated in my head. But many times someone will give me too much money. And it's like it happens to me, Kathleen. It must happen to me like almost once a week. I'm not keeping someone else's quarter. I'm not sitting on a, on a wood bench in hell next to Hitler who had his mustache burned off for eternity over 25 cents. Are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? And many of the decisions that you make are that insignificant long term, although it may look big to you. Someone moving a decimal point by accident. Someone saying something that they're going to they're going to give it to you at a certain price and then they bring it down even lower. and You don't correct them. That wasn't the deal that you initially made three days ago. That is a, a point of ethics, not just a point of a word of knowledge, but it's a point of ethics. When the spirit of truth comes on you and you ignore the truth. The ethical components of the daily things that you're dealing with, you are ignoring the Holy Spirit. And I want to tell you the majority of the church today, not this church, not this ministry, and not the majority of people that have been watching us for some period of time. But there is an ethical compound to everything that we do all day long. The Bible says prophetically, I believe it's in the book of Isaiah, that each man's neighbor is neighing after his neighbor's wife. In other words, there was a time in Israel when everyone was messing around. We know that certainly was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah. If you read really what was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was way more than just sodomy. It was sexual activity on all levels. Josephus talks about it. The book of Jasher talks about it and other other theologians talk about it. And when you have that com component and you have no ethics going on in your head, now that's a greater thing, but there are even lower things. But if there's no ethics in your head, you don't see what adultery and divorce does. And if you can't see what adultery and divorce does, first of all, to the marriage, to the family, to the children, to the grandchildren, it speaks for generations afterwards. And if you can't see what it's doing to society and how it's breaking up society, then you are not paying attention to the ethical components that are being given by the Holy Spirit that we call truth. Now, if you're divorced, if you've gone through a divorce, if things have happened, God can make an omelet out of a scrambled egg. You don't try to go back and put that egg all back together. But you take from where you're at right now and you move on and you say, I am going to listen to the Holy Spirit. I am going to listen to the spirit of truth and the spirit of truth is going to guide me into what? All truth. And so the ethical components of what we're paying attention to is part of the adorning power, the robe of the Holy Spirit. Say, after a while, people will say to you, wow, you, you, you just seem to be right a lot. You seem to know the ethics of things. Then the terminology will not be like that, but they'll say it some way. And you'll begin to have an inner testimony concerning the power of the Holy Spirit operating in you. It's not about tongues any longer. It's about the ethics. It's about truth. It's about word of knowledge. It's about future. Amen. Now, the spirit 
speaking to you is the voice of God. So if the voice of God says, I know a better way to do this, I had something happen to me. We were looking at pickup trucks, Kathy. Me and one of my sons were looking at pickup trucks back a year and a half ago. We went to a dealership and it was so many thousands of dollars. <laughs> it was expensive. And I didn't feel right about it. And I kind of sat there in the chair and said, okay, I guess, you know. And we couldn't buy it because I think it was a Saturday, whatever the day was. And they said, uh, or it was the end of the month or whatever was going on. And they said, well, we'll call you on Monday. I said, fine. They never called us. And I kind of acted mopey and hung around the house. And then you on a Wednesday or a Thursday that week said, or Friday, said, let's go and look at pickup trucks. We went out looking at pickup trucks. I didn't want to go. But Kathy was hearing from the Holy Spirit. We got onto a car lot and one truck just to see, seemed to have all the sunlight hitting this one truck. I mean, it was like arrows were pointing at it, neon lights on it. I walked over there. That truck was $20,000 lower than the other truck I was looking at from a similar dealership, similar. And on top of that, I love that truck to this day. When I saw that truck, I claimed it as mine. The Holy Spirit will bedeck you with the garland of nice pickup trucks at $20,000 less than some other truck that won't bedeck you at all. Amen. What I'm saying is this, that the Holy Spirit can direct you and give you an inner witness or an ethics problem that you wouldn't get any other way because you can't get them any other way. The natural man cannot know the Spirit of God or the things of God. Why? Because he's a natural man only listening and paying attention to natural things. He only sees bland numbers. He doesn't know what's behind the numbers. He doesn't know what's going on. So the Holy Spirit gives you a outer covering of protection to show you what's going on in the spiritual realm. And this is why you need all of you including children, need to be listening to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will protect you, but you must walk in the Holy Spirit. It's not enough to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit and the voice of God is the Holy Spirit. He's the one that's talking to you. And he'll always be redirecting you. I get redirected. I can, you know, if I tell you, it's the Holy Ghost <laughs> directing me. I can say it that way, or I can just say it 20 times yesterday, the Holy Spirit redirected me to go a different direction. Or I can make it sound real spiritual. And I go, the Holy Ghost <laughs> directed me 20 times yesterday. However I say it, however you need to hear it, is exactly what the Holy Spirit does. And if you listen, if you walk by the Holy Spirit, you won't know where you're going it happens to me so often. It'll be the direction of a scripture, the direction of something on a computer program because I do so much computer work. It'll be buying things. It'll be, it'll be actually calling up one place to see if they have something in stock and the Holy Spirit say, don't call them, you're wasting your time. I go, I just want to check out and see if you're right, Holy Spirit. No, that's true. That's okay to do. And here's the reason why. Now you begin to hear and see whether or not you're hearing from the Holy Spirit, you're hearing from yourself, or you're hearing from a demon. And you can begin to find out who's speaking to you and get used to the Spirit of God speaking to you inside of you. So you call this one place, sure enough, they don't have anything. And it took you 10 minutes to get to that department in that store. Then you call up the other place like you should have the first time, and you call up and in 30 seconds you find out that they have that product, and not only that, it's on sale right now. So all you say, well, would you hang on to that for me? I'll be right down to get that. And you just pick it up now, $3 less, and it's in stock. The Holy Spirit works that way. See, the Holy Spirit just doesn't work on the power gifts, but works on the external things that actually give you an internal witness and an external witness to other people around you. How come it always works out for you that way? How come you keep getting these good deals? Why is it that you keep tripping over these things? You can say, well, the carnal man wouldn't know what I'm about to talk about, but I have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that would go, you're right, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. 
because the carnal man cannot understand it. Let's go over to Hebrews chapter 5, Hebrews 5, verse 11. Concerning him, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers and you have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice... Everyone say, because of practice. Because of practice. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. The Bible says over in Proverbs that the wicked man points with his fingers, winks with his eye, and points with his feet. And you can tell uh, a, you can, you can see an unrighteous man. It also says that someone who is holding a grudge against you raises his chin. Now that's in certain interpretations. But that's all there right just in the book of Proverbs. So if you ever have someone come to you like this and start kind of, they're looking at you like this. Uh huh. How many of you know you can read that? And right here in Hebrews chapter 5, we're finding out that there are some things that we can have our senses trained for. Your senses are your five natural senses, right? What you can see, what you can smell, what you can taste, what you can touch. Your five natural senses will tell you that there's something wrong with the person that's talking to you. Sure it will. That's why we watch television. And that's why they raise up the scary music when something scary is about to happen. Not only can you see what's about to happen, but they raise up the music so you have an added, added weight and proof that you're about to come into a bad part of this movie. It's infecting your senses. You can have your senses trained to discern good and evil. So how do you have your senses trained to discern good and evil? Think about this. You can have your senses trained to discern good and evil right away. And you train yourself. And training means you go through training. You don't go through a day of training. You go through training. And training is continuous. Oh, you know, on-the-job training is continuous. It's all the time. So if you have your senses trained to discern good and evil, you'll recognize someone who's married but might be a homosexual because there'll be little activities going on with their eyes and their movements. You'll see people that are about to fall in their marriage. You'll see it happening because of the activity and they're spending too much time with the other sex. There are people that outwardly have all kinds of scriptural references. They open up their Bible, they're online all the time, they're liking stuff and suggesting scriptures all the time, and yet if you look into their life, there's no following the Holy Spirit at all. They've changed their language, but not their behavior. And the reason why they haven't changed their behavior is even though they may have received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they haven't been walking in the Holy Spirit. And someone who's not walking in the Holy Spirit will eventually, like Scripture says, a dog returns to his own vomit. No, I didn't make that up. And eventually, those that cease or stop at some point to walking in the Holy Spirit will eventually become carnal, so carnal, even though their language is different, even though their vision is, maybe they cleaned up their act as far as their clothing, maybe they're attending church all the time, but because they haven't been listening to the Holy Spirit, they will return to carnal base activity. Someplace they probably never thought that they would go back to, or they secretly covered and made like they were hearing from the Holy Spirit when they never were. And then they end up worse off 
than they ever were previously. Jesus said that when a demon goes out of a man, he goes out into dry, waterless places, and he goes back and he brings seven other devils worse than him, and finding that man, referring to a man or a woman, finding that man swept and clean and with no protection, he moves in and the second state of that man is worse than the first. It's a dangerous thing to play like we're walking in the Spirit of God when we're not walking in the Spirit of God. And it doesn't have to be major things. It could be little minor things like this. Don't pick up that bread. That'll turn green in two days. This loaf over here is fresh. Little things like that. And you can test the spirit. And then if you want to, test the spirit and look at the back or the label on there and find out when the, when the processing date was. You'll actually see that the dates will be different. Little things like that. You can walk in the spirit because the spirit wants to bedeck you. Give you garland on your head. Wants to not only change you internally, but prosper you as a result of everything that he's doing in you. There's no lack in God. Can I hear an amen? amen. Now, let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 7. But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. All right, we've read that a lot of times here in this, in this ministry. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, and to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, and to another the effecting of miracles, and to another prophecy, and to another distinguishing of spirits, and to another various kinds of tongues, and to another interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. What is this? What are these gifts then? These, this, this is part of the gifts that we get from the Holy Spirit, part of what we get. But I look at this, this section now, and the Holy Spirit gave me this terminology. These gifts, these nine gifts of the Holy Spirit are a tool belt for God's tools. Man comes up, he's wearing a tool belt, he's got his hammer, he's got his screwdrivers, he's got his staple gun, he's got other things, he's got his gloves on, he's got his measuring tape, and he comes onto a job. He's got a pencil in his ear, and he gets at that job, and he's got all of his tools on him. He's not going to be using them all the time, but he's got his tools when he needs them. This is God's tool belt for us. These are external things. That we can, they're happening internally, but we can see them happening externally. So this allows us, this tool belt, when we begin to use this tool belt, we begin to see God and live. There's some terminology in the Word of God that said no one can see the face of God and live. And that's still true today. And I can answer this question over a period of, a long period of time, but to keep this short, we can see God for who He is right now. How can we see God for who he is right now? We can be walking with this tool belt and we can see these giftings and we can see this power and we can now begin to see God as he is incrementally. We can't take in all of God. We can't see all of God, but we can begin to understand him, to see him in an understanding way by walking with these tools. So we get to see God by using these tools. And you could say that these tools are the utility gifts of God. They provide utility. You have to put them to work. So on the day of Pentecost, what do we see? You can see tongues, but what you can't see was the other things happening. You can't see that everyone was getting a personal revelation of the Spirit, and so they were excited. They're speaking in other tongues. But what was, how did 3,000 people get saved in one day? One day. Soon after that, 5,000 on another day. How did that happen? 
It happened because there was an internal witness of the Holy Spirit where people were getting a revelation of who God was by the Spirit, you, which you can't get in, the carnal in your carnal nature. You just can't do it. You can see a miracle and deny it. But if you have the Holy Spirit, you have an inner witness of the personality of God. You can't get the, you can't get the understanding of his fullness, but you can have an inner witness of his personality. It'll be a revelation of a personal God even though it's intangible, you know it's there. Let's go over to Titus chapter 3. Titus 3. Titus 3 verse 5. He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness. In other words, we do deeds of righteousness. But according to his mercy by the washing and regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit gives us all this clothing. He's clothed you with garments. He's advanced you, bedecked you. He's given you a testimony. He's given you a robe. He's given you a garland. And what happens with garments after you've been wearing them for a while? They get dirty. You live in the world, you're going to get dirty. If you have the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you're going to get dirty. But what does the Holy Spirit do when you're listening? Not when you're just walking in the Holy Spirit, but when you're really walking in the Holy Spirit. Not talking about being Superman in God, but we're talking about just simply listening to that still, quiet voice. When you're listening to that still, quiet voice, that regeneration and that renewing that we're seeing here in verse 5, that regeneration and that renewing is the washing of your garments continually. It's the washing of all those garments that God gave you by the Holy Spirit. It's the regeneration, washing, making new, repairing, sewing, adding buttons back on. It is constantly bringing you into a place because when you're in the world, Listen, I'm in the world a lot, and I can tell you the world is not that clean. It's never been that clean. There was a murder right after Adam and Eve got out of the Garden of Eden. The first church service that we read about, there's a murder in church. Between two brothers, nevertheless. The world is not clean. We live in a sinful society, in a sinful world, but one thing can save us, and that is listening to the Holy Spirit. By listening to that still, small voice, what we do is we keep having our clothing washed. And I tell you what, I don't know about you, but I see a lot of stuff out there. And the cleaner your garments are, the more you tend to see happening in the world. If you can say, yeah, I just don't see anything which the pastor's talking about, you may not be listening to the Holy Spirit. You may not be paying attention to that still small voice telling you to get away from this, do this, and just simply bless you in areas that you don't think the Holy Spirit is even interested in. The Holy Spirit's not about having church. The Holy Spirit is about changing you into another man, making you into another person. And the Holy Spirit can only be doing that by regeneration or renewing day by day, which is a very carnal act. It, you, it's, he's not going to force himself on you and change you into another man if you don't want to listen to him. And we know scripture says very clearly, you can receive the Holy Spirit and then you can participate in acts where the Holy Spirit says, I cannot participate in this. Will the Holy Spirit join himself to a prostitute? The Apostle Paul says, may it never be. So a man filled with the Holy Spirit that goes to a prostitute or goes to another woman who's not his wife and a woman who does the same thing goes to another man that's not her husband, the Holy Spirit can leave that person. And the Holy Spirit will leave that person, will not stay, stay joined. And then they become carnal once again and go more and more back into the world and then they can't figure out how it happened. Amen. Let's go over to Matthew 22. Matthew 22, verse 11. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? 
Some people are going to be approached. How is it that you didn't listen to my voice through the Holy Spirit? Many people like those 10 virgins waiting. Their oil ran out. They weren't listening to the Holy Spirit. How is it? And the man was speechless because he knows he heard the Holy Spirit, but he didn't walk according to the Holy Spirit. And the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. He was invited. He was almost there, but he didn't get there because he was not wearing white wedding clothes. We must listen. There is no one that's free from this. I'm not free from it. I don't know anyone that's old enough to be free from it. That if we're not listening to the Holy Spirit, within a period of time, we'll become carnal in nature. The Holy Spirit will tell you to get away from a conversation. The Holy Spirit will tell you not to listen to this type of complaining. The Holy Spirit will get you away from people that are bad for you, or at least if you can't get away from them, to shut your ears to it. You'll find it's better to be outside. Finally, I'm going to close it here in Psalm 51. Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, David is speaking and he's being reminded of his sin. And he says in Psalm 51, verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Jump down to verse 7. Purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. He's not talking about his skin being white. He's talking about his outer raiment, his robe, his clothing to be white. Amen. Make me to hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Because David would do one thing. With the Holy Spirit, he listened to the Holy Spirit. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. What will happen then? I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Let's all stand. Amen. Amen. So the adornment of the Holy Spirit is in comprehensible ways incomprehensible ways. It's external and it's internal. It's noticeable and unnoticeable. It creates an external witness and an internal witness inside of you. It's front and back and all the same at the same time. It's not just about tongues. It's not just about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but much more than that. It's about protection. It's about increase it's about creating a living, walking testimony concerning who you are. Amen. Amen? If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you'd like to do that right now, if you're here today, or if you're watching us on television, if you're watching us live, just bow your heads right now. We're going to go through a sinner's prayer like we do every Sunday. Say, dear Jesus, dear Jesus. Come into my heart right now and make me a new person, a new creation. I don't want to be that old person anymore. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for me so that I don't have to die for all the things that I've done wrong. In Jesus' name, amen and amen and amen. Now, if you just made that decision for Jesus Christ, write us here. But the second thing is this. If you don't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit yet, if you've never been introduced to it before, and it's something that you want to receive, there's no distance in time. There's no distance in distance. If you can watch me, you can receive a godly thing. Because if you can watch me, you're watching by man-made hands, and you can receive something from God's very hands right now. Amen. So if you want to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I invite you to do so. Stand to your feet if you can. Stretch out your hands towards heaven. 
I command the baptismal Holy Spirit to fall on you from the top of your head to the soles of your feet with signs and wonders and Amen. garland and robes and clothing and a still small voice speaking to you all the days of your life. And I command that thing done right now in Jesus' mighty name. And amen, and amen, and amen. Well, if you just received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or if you just gave Jesus Christ your heart, you're now going to be going to heaven. You just change your zip code, Kathleen, amen. forever. It's a great feeling, and it's a great witness. Amen. Write me here at David Gonzalez Ministries, P.O. Box 847, Lake Delton, Wisconsin, 52940. And I want to send out this free little booklet to you. It's called, Is the Bible for Real? It's a book that I wrote, and it tells you on the validity of the Bible and lets you know the decision that you just made for Jesus Christ. Okay. A couple more things. If you're watching on Facebook, make sure that you click like and love and make some comments. If you're watching on uh, YouTube, click subscribe. And Kathy, this is Pastor Dave and Kathy saying, Press into God. And he'll press into you. And we'll see you again here this week at, at the mountain. Amen and amen.